I'm glad it's my uh, pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Rebecca Jowers. And the way she came about to be here today, there's been a lady that I'm sure you remember. Her name is Bernadette, and she's from uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, and she has visited us several times. <clears throat> the last time she was here, maybe four weeks ago, five weeks ago, she commended uh, uh, Ms. Jowers to me because she had attended the Farmersville Rotary Club, and she made her presentation, and she gave me her business card. So I researched a bit about what she does and what it's about, and I thought it would be, I knew it would be interesting to me, and I hope it will be interesting to you. But let me give you a few things about her. She received her Bachelor of Science in Education from the University of Texas in El Paso and graduated summa cum laude. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Her, her daughter's graduating top of her class in law school. But anyway, she taught math and science in public schools and then became a math instructor at the University of Texas in El Paso. Then she earned a master's degree in Dallas Theological Seminary and received the Howard Hendricks Award for the most outstanding work in the Department of Christian Education. And then she worked in the Spiritual Formation Department at Dallas Theological Seminary in the area of leadership development. And she holds certification from the Evangel ETA, Evangelical, I can't say that, Inve Evangelical, thank you, I got my tongue tangled up, a, a training association in the Christian Association of Sexual Educators, and she's also with the Relational Assessment for Premarital Counseling and Marital Enrichment Programs, and she currently leads, this. I'm getting to where the program that she's going to present today. She leads the Human Trafficking Ministry at Lake Point Church in Rockwall and founded the Poema Foundation. And that's a nonprofit which educates the public and raises awareness to prevent conditions that foster sex trafficking. Poema also has a safe house for survivors of human trafficking. Sad that that's needed, but it's wonderful that it's being provided. Poema facilitates the restoration journey of exploited persons by providing for their physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual needs. And the best thing about her, I've saved for last. Uh, she's married to her husband, Raymond, for 28 years, and they have four daughters, uh, ranging in age from 19 to 25. It's a 25-year-old, I presume, that just graduated from law school. Well, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Rebecca Jowers to our presentation. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Thank you, David. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Rotary is near and dear to my heart. My husband's been a Rotarian for 22 years um, at the Rockwall Noon Rotary, and so I've spoken to a lot of Rotary groups, and I love what you guys do. It's just an amazing organization. Am I standing in the way of this? Okay. Um, so basically what I'm here today, what I'm going to do is I know I've got about 20, 25 minutes. And so I'm going to give you a 10 minute overview of a one hour training that I do on human trafficking 101. It's just basically this is human trafficking. This is what it looks like. Here's how it happens. But I only have 10 minutes to give you really an hour's worth of information. So it's just going to be a high view of it. And then I want to spend about 10 minutes. Um, usually I, I try to give more of that presentation, but it always ends on a down note. And so what I've started doing is I want to take the last 10 minutes to tell you what we do, what Poema does in response to that, and then we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions. So I'm going to begin by talking about slavery. Whenever I do this presentation, we love to educate people about the problem, and typically I'll go in and I'll ask, hey, do you believe slavery is happening in the world today, and what would your response be? Yes, and so slavery is actually illegal in every country in the world, but there are more slaves today than at any other time in our world's history, sadly. And so then I'll ask the question, well, what about closer to home? What about the home of the brave and the land of the free? What about in America? Is there slavery going on in the United States? I would say no several years ago if you had asked me that question. I would say it's unfortunately a part of our country's history, a part we still have scars that we're dealing with today, but I don't see people in slavery, do you? It's something that's hidden and underground, and that's really when I was introduced to human trafficking, that's really what human trafficking is. It's a form of modern-day slavery. And basically, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed in 2000. I'm just going to kind of sum it up for you. Human trafficking involves controlling a person using force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of exploiting them. 
There can be labor trafficking, there can be sex trafficking. We primarily deal with victims and survivors of sex trafficking. And so in order to get um, a conviction for human trafficking, you have to prove three things. You have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. If the person is over the age of 18, if they are an adult, that makes it really difficult, and I'll share a little bit later why people will ask me many times, well, we know trafficking is happening at that hotel right down the street. Why aren't they doing something about it? You can't just go in and arrest somebody if the victim is over the age of 18 without being able to prove force, fraud, or coercion. You're not gonna, the person's just gonna get out the next day. It's not gonna hold up in court. Now, if the victim being trafficked is a minor, it is a little bit easier to get this conviction because you don't have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. So that's basically what human trafficking is. When I was first learning about human trafficking, and the FBI estimates that there are between 100 and 300,000 trafficking victims in the United States every year. So being a former math science teacher, I'm thinking to myself, really? Where are you getting that statistic? I've taught in the Badios in South El Paso. I've worked with at-risk populations who you would think would be people that are more vulnerable to be trafficking victims. So I, I just thought, how can, that, how can that be such a problem? And so if you look at this map right here, this is a picture of the trafficking victims, uh, I'm sorry, of the Polaris Project's um, recent study that they've done. If you go online to the Polaris Project, there's a 1-800 number that people can call if they see something in the community that looks like human trafficking. They can call and report to this number. It's also a number that victims can call if there's someone who's trapped in sex trafficking or labor trafficking, they can call this number. So the map that you're looking at is a picture of all the calls that came in in 2016. The recent map is out, I just haven't updated it, but every year they do this report. You can go onto their website and look at this. Um, California received the highest number of calls. Texas was number two. Now, that doesn't mean that we have the second highest number of trafficking victims, because I, I guarantee you, if you go to Las Vegas, there are a ton of girls being trafficked there. Atlanta, a ton of girls being trafficked there. Atlantic City, I mean, there are other cases. So actually, the fact that Texas is number two, looking at the glass half, half full, is, is a good thing in the sense that it's on people's radar. People are making that phone call. They are reporting. It's something that we, you know, we say, see something, say something. The governor's office has really had a big initiative to try to fight this. If you go to the website, there's a um, documentary that they just recently put out called um, Be the One. And it's a, basically kind of an HT 101 awareness, raising awareness about what trafficking looks like in Texas. So does this look like a problem in the United States? There have been phone calls from all 50 states. So human trafficking is happening everywhere. What does it look like more close to home for us in Texas? The School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin just recently put out a study. And in this study, they found that there were 313,000 trafficking victims in the state of Texas. Of that number, 234,000 were labor trafficking cases. But sadly, 79,000 of those victims were minors underage children being sold for sex. So that's a huge number. Sex trafficking is a big problem in Texas. And being out in some of the rural areas, many times we think that we are uh, more immune to that, but I'm gonna share some stories that kind of tell you where trafficking is happening. So this is what it looks like in Texas. Does it look like a problem? It definitely is. Well. Being a former um, math science teacher, working with kids for over 20 years, I kind of started asking myself, well, who are these children that are being trafficked? Why haven't I seen a trafficking victim? Say we take the conservative number of 100,000 children being trafficked, and that's just minors. That doesn't take into account the day that child turns 18, and then they're an adult. So really, the number is even higher. So what does that look like? Who, who is vulnerable to be a victim? What does a trafficking victim look like? What I found that it wasn't a particular um, socioeconomic group, it wasn't just children living in poverty. Um, we've had middle class girls, we've had upper middle class girls in our safe house who have been victims of trafficking. It's not a particular race or ethnicity. We've had African American girls, Asian girls, Hispanic girls, Anglo Anglos, you know, it's across the board. But what I did find were common vulnerability factors. And so the first one is just age. A child is vulnerable to become a trafficking victim simply because they're a child. And the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop till you're about 25. 
um, just check your um, driving insurance if you're insuring younger people. The day they turn 25, what happens? Yeah. Your rates go down, hopefully, if they haven't had an accident. Um, but there's research that shows us, well, these predators know that, and they prey on children because they are vulnerable. And because what do we teach our children to do? Be respectful, obey adults. <laughs> and so they're easily coerced. The average age a child's recruited into trafficking, they recently just did a study, and they said in, in um, Texas for girls it was 15. In that study that was recently done, the FBI estimates across the board it's about 12 or 13 years old across the United States. So very young. Boys are also victims of trafficking. I'm mostly going to be talking about girls and women today because that's the population that we serve. But we do have boys that are victims of trafficking. And as far as I know right now, there's only one house in the United States, I believe it's in North Carolina, that provides aftercare for young boys who have been trafficked. Okay, so we have age. We have dysfunctional families. Okay, how many? whose family doesn't have any dysfunction? <laughs> We have four daughters. They were all teenagers at one time. You know, we, we live in a fallen world. There is dysfunction in the world. Um, however, what happens with the dysfunction is the perpetrator finds what the point of dysfunction is and preys on that. So, for instance, in the case of the girl from the upper middle class family that was trafficked, her stepfather is a pastor. Her mom is um, a businesswoman, very successful in her job. Uh, what happened is this young girl has what we call a father wound. So her biological father got involved with drugs. He's incarcerated. And her mother, thinking that she's going to protect her daughter, broke that relationship off and wouldn't. And there was just a lot of pain there. There's dysfunction there. She wouldn't let her daughter have a relationship with her biological father. So she has a father wound. And there's something about a child that always wants to know and be loved by their biological parent. And, and so this, this girl had this wound, and the perpetrator figured that out and stepped in and became a father, or many pimps will have their girls call them daddy, and they fill in that role of being the father to the young girl. And so that is very common. So the dysfunction in family it can be anything. It can be a divorce. It can be um, a death of a parent at a young age. There's a lot of different ways that dysfunction, the perpetrators just prey on that. We have a history of trauma and abuse. About 90% of the girls that we have helped were sexually abused as a child prior to being recruited into trafficking. So sexual abuse is really detrimental, and many times people don't ask for help um, in, until they're into their um, adult years, and many times even then. I did a presentation, uh, shared my testimony at a church, and I had a pastor come up to me who was in his 60s. And he said, I've never told anybody this before, but when I was a child, my sister molested me. And he's in his 60s and has never shared it. It's not something that you want to share with people, but it makes a child very vulnerable uh, because of the wounds that are created there um, to be then um, looking for value and self-worth. And these perpetrators prey on that as well. Drug abuse by parents. I'm going to share um, one story. We had a young girl who her mother started selling her when she was about four years old. And so um, I, this is a really hard story, but I'm going to share it to make a, two, two points. Um, she, walked, she, she told me that she defended her mother when um, her stepdad walked in the room and she was sitting on the bed next to her mom and her mom was helping her get her clothes back on and there was a man on the bed next to her mother. And a, her stepfather walked in the room and said, why are her clothes off? And he was angry, as he should be. But what she didn't understand, you know, as we began unpacking that, she said, you know, I defended my mom. And I said, oh, I was just, mama was just helping me get my clothes back on. It's okay. What happened was she didn't understand being a four-year-old and that being her normal situation. We began talking about it. What she realized is her stepfather was a pimp. He was controlling her mother through a drug addiction. And so he wouldn't give her her next hit of a, hit of a drug till she met Quota. I've never been in a situation, I have four daughters, I can't ever imagine being in such a desperate situation that I would think if I could just sell my daughter this one time, I'll have some money he doesn't know about and I can get my next hit of a drug. I've never been in that desperate situation. Um, so for this young woman, for her to understand why her mother did that, you know, and her mother actually became a Christian, we're a faith-based organization, so I talk a little bit about that, but... Her uh, mother ended up becoming a Christian, and years later, when she was in her 20s, went back and asked for forgiveness. Well, this young girl at 11 years old started taking drugs to self-medicate her own pain. At 15, selling herself on the street for 15 bucks to get her next hit of a drug. She says, well, I never had a pimp. It was my choice. I chose this life. And many times I get that question, well, these girls are choosing that life, right? It's easy money. I would say this woman didn't want to be there. 
She felt like it was the only option that she had. So we help a lot of girls who are being, I call commercial sexual exploitation instead of using the P word or calling them a prostitute. Um, I really haven't ever met a woman on the street, whether she had a perpetrator controlling her or it was a life situation like this that wants to be there. And so what we try to do is take that, that P word out of our vocabulary and use commercial sexual exploitation or human trafficking because many of them do have um, perpetrators controlling them. So um, drug use by parents um, or other people, it's huge, plays a huge part of it. And then mental illness, we have a lot of girls that plays into it as well and runaways. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to go into that. So we have a safe house and these girls, my staff wants to go home and celebrate, but guess what? We have girls who have no family and so we become their family. Sometimes it's a friend. Here's a picture of um, Shayla Williams. She was um, recruited at 16. Now she's 19 and she's recruiting young girls. And she met a 14, 15 year old girl on social media. That girl was mad at her mom. She's a single parent raising three kids. And she's putting on social media, well, I hate my mom. She won't let me go out. I have to stay home. And Shayla Williams is all over that. There are so many perpetrators on the Internet. That's the way most of our victims have been recruited. And she's like, well, give me your, give me your address. I'll come pick you up. You know, you can come hang out. You can sleep on my couch. There's no rules here. So being a 14-year-old girl whose prefrontal cortex, cortex isn't fully developed, who's mad at her mother and bored, gives the address. And William Jacobs and Shayla Williams go and pick her up. They both um, drug her, have sex with her, take pictures. They take her to an extended stay motel in Louisville, put it on her advertisement online. A UNT professor buys her, several UNT students buy her, and then they take her on a five-state tour over a period of two weeks where they sell her out of hotels, have her drugged up the whole time. And then they ended up back at that extended stay motel in Louisville. And somebody like you who came to a training and saw what was happening, realized something doesn't seem right here. Here's an, an older guy. He's got two younger girls with him. They kind of seem a little bit out of it. There's cars coming and going from their hotel room. Ding, ding, ding. Something doesn't look right here. So they called law enforcement. And because she was underage, law enforcement could go in and rescue her and pull her out of that. And so that's why we say, if you see something, please say something. So sometimes it's a stranger. What about this guy, Nathan Tatarko? He did three tours in Afghanistan, married with two children. He was driving over by a mall in the Mid-Cities area. It was a rainy day like today. 14-year-old little girl's walking on the street. Hey, honey, get in my car. Let me give you a ride. And she's like, no, I don't want to ride. Come on, let me give you a ride. Looks like a clean-cut, nice guy. She gets in the car. He gives her drugs, alcohol, has sex with her in the back seat. His friends have sex with her, and then they start selling her out of a strip club. And so the reason I show these pictures is we have a stereotype of what a pimp looks like or what a perpetrator looks like. And we do have perpetrators and pimps that look like that, that dress like that. There's a whole pimp culture. Sadly, a lot of young boys look up to that type of a, you know, figure as a role model. Um, but also look at these other people. Shayla Williams looks like a girl who may sit at my table with my daughters and have, you know, dinner one night. Or William Tatarko. And so we have to kind of change our mindset of what a perpetrator looks like. And what we really need to be doing is looking at behavior and what they're doing and how they act. So grooming, perpetrators groom adults first to get to your children. Sex offenders and traffickers will groom the parents first in order to get to the children. That's a huge part of it. And then boyfriends. We have a lot of Romeo pimps that will um, promise the girl a girl the world. I'll let, you know, let's get married. We'll have children. We'll have a house. Um, we call this the honeymoon period. And six months later, he'll talk her into running away with him. And then she finds out that she's got a quota she has to meet. There's all these other girls in what they call the stable. And if she doesn't go out on the streets and work, then they what they will do is put a girl in the middle of a circle and the pimps will all gang rape her in front of all the other girls. And that's what happens if you don't reach quota. So there's, when we talk about force, fraud, and coercion, that's what it looks like. And it's really horrific things. I have a lot of really hard stories I'm not going to share with you. Um, but it, it gives you the example of how these guys control these girls. And people will ask me, why don't they ask for help? Why don't they run away? Well, part of that is because of trauma bonding. When you have some children and this guy steps in and he gives her food, clothing, and shelter, you know what? Sometimes that's more than anybody's done for her before. And he tells her that he loves her and he takes, I saw a pimp at North Park Mall in Dallas, two girls on his, you know, one on each, or had his arm around each one. And I was with my daughter and it was when I first started working in this ministry and I kind of nudged her and I said, a guy and his girls, God just opened my eyes to that. Otherwise I would have never seen it. They would have walked right on by and I would have thought, well, that's kind of weird. He's with two girls, you know. 
but just I started looking at the signs, tattoos, just different things, behavior, the age difference. And what happens is he's developing a bond with these girls. And so with trauma bonding, it makes it really difficult to identify a victim because guess what? Victims don't self-identify. Um, many people <clears throat> that have been abused, will they don't even recognize themselves as victims. And so that becomes a problem. So when law enforcement does go in and they rescue this girl, and she's not saying, thank you so much for rescuing me. Oh, I'm so glad. And she's spitting on law enforcement and cussing them out and, you know, running back to her pimp as soon as she can. Do they appear to be a victim? We had one young girl at our safe house for six months. She kept saying, I've got to get back to work full time soon. She was 18. She just aged out of foster care two weeks prior. And she just kept saying, I've got to get back to work full time soon. I said, well, tell me about that. Why do you feel like you have to go back to work? And she said, well, I've got a little sister. She's 16, and they told me that she's gonna, they're going to kill her if I don't get back to work. Do you know why she believed that? Because they had taken her out to a campground, dug a hole, put her in the hole. She kept refusing to do what they wanted, which was have sex with grown men, put another little girl in the hole, and actually killed that girl in front of her. That's what forced fraud and coercion looks like. And that's why these girls, many times, will run back to their perpetrator. And so we are very... Um, the way we do our aftercare model is we take all that into account. If a girl runs, she can wait 30 days, but she can reapply to come back to our program. A lot of programs won't let them come back if they run. They think they're choosing to go back to that life. So um, this is driven by supply and demand. You know, obviously there's a lot of money to be made. This is Hortensia Medilis, another perpetrator. She made over $1.6 million in just over a year. She, had the, she was the matriarch of a familial trafficking ring. She had all these family members recruiting. And so there's a lot of money to be made. Um, this is, you know, we, we wonder what does this look like? Here's uh, the, the count, Rockwell County Sheriff's Department in conjunction with some other organizations did a sting in Rockwell and put an ad online for a 15-year-old girl to be bought for sex. These eight men answered and came. And so it's happening in our little communities. I mean, Rockwell's a little community, right? One of the smallest seats in the county of Texas or smallest county in, in Texas, it, it's happening. And it's happening here in Greenville as well. So what can we do? I've got some information up here. That 1-800 number I talked about is up here. There's an app called Operation Compass North Texas. You can download on your phone where you can anonymously report. But always call local law enforcement, particularly if someone's in, if there's an imminent threat. Um, so this is a real heavy topic. I want to kind of switch gears to what POEMA does and what our response to it is. So our first thing is prevention education, something like this. Last year, we educated over 2,400 people about the dangers of human trafficking. We particularly like to get in to talk to teachers, counselors, and kids if they'll let us. So we, I speak at a lot of churches, so I've spoken to a lot of youth groups, a lot of service organizations. So we're passionate about prevention education for sure. If we can prevent it from happening, that's better. Um, second is our community awareness. So we take posters of missing kids to over 860 establishments across the Metroplex. We have nine different campuses, and we partner with a private investigator. And so these, when a girl goes missing, I've had girls from Royce City that went missing. Um, people will call us, or we partner with NICMEC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We take these posters to the hotels, and then there's a 1-800 number that they can call a tip in. So last Saturday, we had a call from a hotel off of I-35 in Dallas. Um, the guy that was working there, the desk clerk, said there's six rooms here where they have underage girls, and we didn't know what to do about it. And so they called and gave us the information. Our team was on it. Our intel team was on it. We identified three perpetrators, two pimps that actually live in Terrell, Texas, and a woman that lives in Royce City. Um, so we've got – we put together uh, – Case, um, information cases on that and turn it over to Homeland Security or FBI or local law enforcement. It just depends whatever jurisdiction or who's working on the case. So we're actually maybe going to be starting an outreach in Greenville because I have a, I just spoke with a volunteer who's going to be uh, meeting with me about doing outreach. So we would do Greenville, Sulphur Springs, and the, and the surrounding area, which I'd be really excited about. And then we also take down license plates and we have ways of tracking human trafficking rings and phone numbers associated with the VIN number with vehicles. And so when we're at those hotels, we're taking down vehicles that look suspicious. We actually have a man working with us who was a drug trafficker and human trafficker who's spent his time incarcerated and actually had a salvation experience and he serves with us now. So he'll say, write down that car. We're like, that car? Why? And he's like, just write it down. So um, we do. And then finally, we have a safe house where we provide long-term um, 
trauma-informed care. It's a residential program, and this is what our little house looks like. We've gotten service dogs for three different girls. Uh, we do, do equine therapy. A lot of things happen with animals. Um, the girls can't even sit and do face-to-face -face counseling. It's real difficult sometimes, but they'll do it with um, dogs and with um, horses, so that's been really great. Uh, we have Bible studies there. We have a little garden in the back. It's very therapeutic. The girls love that to plant something, watch it grow, nurture it, and then actually serve it on the table for dinner. Art therapy is a big part of what we do as well, and we partner with some great psychologists that provide the therapy. We also provide education, GED, or um, high school diploma program, and some of our girls are actually in college. We have a girl who will be a senior after this semester at the University of North Texas, and um, it's been really amazing to watch her journey. She was actually adopted in the Philippines for the purpose of being trafficked when she was three days old by an American serviceman. So it's been a very long journey. She's in her 30s now. And she's overcome so much and really doing a great job. There's a lot of other ways to be involved. I want to end with a two-minute video of a poem that a girl wrote in our safe house. Hey, guys. So I wrote this poem. It's called Little Girl. And I used to be that little girl. But thanks to programs like Playbook and Refuge City, I'm now a confident woman who knows who she is and who loves her. Hey, little girl, why do you cut? And why do you flinch every time you're cut? Who treated you wrong? Who put you down? Why was your smile in the place of a thumb? Why is the pain where names can bear? Who abused you and made your heart tear? Why do you accept love in all the wrong ways? Who did this to you and thought you was okay? Why do you cry in your bed all alone? How come you have never felt at home? Why do you walk with your head hanging low? Because nobody showed you that they love you so. Hey, little girl, you know you don't have to hurt. There's a man who loves you and has gone through much worse. He lifts up above and is watching from her. He will show you what you are really worth. His name is Jesus, and he died for our sins. You may think that you know him, but meet him again. He's part of the God that's really one. The Father God, the Spirit, and the Son. He's not a God of anger. That's not who he is. He is a good daddy. He loves all his kids. Help open your eyes and believe in your heart. He's waiting for you. You're never too far. So get up to the dirt and put on your crown. You're a child of the king, so quit looking now. You're worth more than diamonds and silver and pearl. And to him, you'll always be daddy's little boy. So it's 1 o'clock and I'm going to end because I promised to end on time. But I will stay up here for questions if you have questions afterwards. And um, David, again, thank you for letting me be here and share about our ministry. So thank you. This video has been brought to you by Juice34. GEUS is your community-owned provider for electric, internet, cable TV, and true local programming.